Hello and welcome to another episode of Gemstone Mine. I'm John, and today we have another lesson from CEDH. CEDH is a metagame within the Greater Commander format that sits at one extreme with highly consistent, highly efficient decks. Not all cards are equally powerful in all formats, or even in all metagames, but there are lessons to be learned from how people are brewing with the most powerful cards. There are many games of CDH which are decided on the stack, where the fate of the game hangs on the resolution of powerful instants and sorceries like Ad Nauseam or Demonic Consultation, or combos enabled by powerful enchantments like Food Chain or Underworld Breach. But today, we're going to look at CDH decks which still use the combat step to close out the game and see what makes them so strong, and to see if we might learn a few tricks to improve our own decks from outside of CDH which seek to win through combat. Voltron is a good place to start talking about this. Voltron is a popular strategy outside of CDH where you attempt to make one particular creature, usually your commander, as powerful as possible by stacking effects on top of it. There are some prominent members of the commander community who have argued that Voltron is basically unplayable once you start to play against more optimized decks. In CDH, there are several decks which do use commander damage as a win condition, whether primary or at least secondary or, at the very least, use massive damage in combat as a win condition. In CDH, however, there's very little in the way of resources being invested into making a particular commander better at attacking. Auras or equipment which grant evasion, protection, or an attack or damage boost are the equivalent of demanding extra cards to make a combo work, which normally only requires two, your A plus B. In CDH, this simply is not done. So before we start talking about individual commanders who are good representatives of combat damage as a win condition in CDH, let's remind ourselves what makes a commander good in CDH. In fact, we had a whole episode about what makes a commander good. In that episode, we identified three possible characteristics. Number one, synergy. Your commander provides access to part of an A plus B combo where half that combo is in your command zone. Or, alternatively, your commander provides you a reason to run cards which are not normally seen outside of your deck because of their powerful synergy with your commander. Number two, value. Your commander provides you a massive boost in cards drawn, mana available, or some other resource over and above what you should have access to at that point in the game. And number three, we identified that color identity does play a factor in choosing your commander. Your commander should be able to provide you the access to the colors you need to have the tools you want to execute on your game plan. Starting with the category of Synergy, we're going to look at two decks from CEDH. Number one, our old friend Godo. This is a zero-card win condition built around Godo, Bandit Warlord. This is a 3-3 legendary creature, Human Barbarian. When Godo, Bandit Warlord enters the battlefield, you may search your library for an equipment card, put it onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. Whenever Goto attacks for the first time each turn, untap it and all samurai you control. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. In the classic CDH Goto deck, you are fetching Helm of the Host, a legendary artifact equipment costing 4 mana. At the beginning of combat on your turn, create a token that's a copy of equipped creature, except the token isn't legendary if the equipped creature is legendary. That token gains haste, and it has an equip of 5. Now, while we've joked around in the past that all you need to do to play Godo is be able to count to 11, really, there's a lot more to it than that. Godo actually makes a lot of very powerful artifact equipment into useful pieces for the deck, enabling him to get Conqueror's Flail, a two-mana equipment which equips for two. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one for each color among permanents you control, but that's not why Godo players fetch the Flail. Instead, it reads as long as Conqueror's Flail is attached to a creature, your opponents can't cast spells during your turn. Once we do resolve Helm of the Host, Godo will generate infinite copies of himself and slam in for infinite combat steps, usually ending with every opponent being defeated. Najil the Blade Blossom is another combat-centric high-synergy commander. She is a legendary creature, human warrior, for two in a red. She is a 3-2. Whenever a warrior attacks, you may have its controller create a 1-1 white warrior creature token that's tapped and attacking. She also has an activated ability for white, blue, black, red, green. Untap all attacking creatures. They gain trample, lifelink, and haste until the end of turn. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. Activate only during combat. Najila forms powerful A plus B combos with cards like Derevi Imperial Tactician. 
a legendary creature bird wizard, a 2-3 with flying for green, white, blue. Derevi's ability reads, whenever Derevi Imperial Tactician enters the battlefield or a creature you control deals combat damage to a player, you may tap or untap target permanent. Derevi also has an activated ability, one green, white, blue. Put Derevi onto the battlefield from the command zone. In this case, Najila does not plan to have Derevi in the command zone. Instead, we're looking at that first ability, where you're able to connect with your warriors, untap your lands or your artifacts to untap white, blue, red, black, green, and then activate Najila again and continue going on with infinite combat steps to win the game. Najila can also combo off with cards like Nature's Will, an enchantment for two green green. Whenever one or more creatures you control deals combat damage to a player, tap all lands that player controls and untap all lands you control. It doesn't take very many creatures for Najila to begin generating infinite mana and thus infinite combat steps and thus infinite damage through an infinite number of creatures, bound only by the life totals of your opponents. Now, it's not just the heavy synergy commanders who can still wreck house in combat. We can also see cards that are more of a value engine in the command zone, such as Paco, Arcane Retriever. Paco is a legendary creature, Elemental Dog, a 3-3 with haste, for 3 red-green. His ability reads, whenever Paco attacks, exile the top card of each player's library and put a fetch counter on each of them. Put a plus one plus one counter on Paco for each non-creature card exiled this way. Paco also partners with Halden, Avid Arcanist. Halden is a 1-4 legendary creature human wizard for 2 and a blue. As mentioned, he partners with Paco. You may play lands and cast non-creature spells from among cards you have exiled that have fetch counters on them. And you may spend mana as though it were mana of any color to cast those spells. In a three-player game, Paco gets very big very quickly, has haste, and gets you access to non-creature cards that you can play on later turns to stay ahead of your opponents in terms of value, while still getting more and more buff. Many games have been ended to this very good boy trampling across the battlefield and smashing face, when in CDH, the biggest creature you're often going to see on the ground is a 5-5. Paco will easily barrel over even the biggest creatures on the battlefield once he gets going. And the whole time, he is generating value which Halden can then access for us at any point in the future if we need to start accessing some of the cards we have exiled with Paco. Even color identity sometimes takes a role in deciding which commanders we're going to pick in CEDH. And one of the newer brews that has been getting very popular in CEDH is the combination of Jeska, Thrice Reborn, and Ishai, Ojitai Dragon Speaker. Jeska is a legendary planeswalker Jeska. She cost two and a red for a zero loyalty planeswalker. Jeska, thrice reborn, enters the battlefield with a loyalty counter on her for each time you've cast a commander from the command zone this game. Her zero loyalty ability is choose target creature until your next turn. If that creature would deal combat damage to one of your opponents, it deals triple that damage to that player instead. She also has a minus X of Jeska deals X damage to each of up to three targets. And of course, Jeska can be your commander, and Jeska has partner. We're partnering Jeska with Ishai, Ojitai Dragon Speaker. Ishai is a legendary creature, Bird Monk, a 1-1 with flying for two white blue. Obviously, Ishai has partner, and whenever an opponent casts a spell, put a plus one, plus one counter on Ishai. One of the most powerful things you can be doing in the Jeskai color identity, red, white, and blue, in CEDH is an Underworld Breach package as your primary win condition. You can get this package off of a single card, such as Spellseeker or Intuition, a line which enables you to access Underworld Breach, mill your entire library into your graveyard, and then, with an infinite storm count, brain freeze out your opponent's libraries and pass the turn to win the game. Jeska is extremely useful in the command zone in a number of decks in CEDH, as she acts as an excellent source of removal that you have access to at any time. Simply cast her, particularly after you've cast your other commander, and you can easily minus one or minus two in order to destroy creatures which are getting in your way, and enabling you to get rid of roadblocks, get rid of staxy creatures, or remove blockers. 
Ishai, Ojitai Dragon Speaker, simply provides us the other part of the white and the blue that we need to access a Jeskai base to access this particular Underworld Breach package. The reason that Ishai and Jeska have proven to be such a powerful combination is that, well, Ishai tends to get very big and very out of hand very quickly. As long as your opponents are doing the normal things you would expect when they're playing Magic, you will see Ishai get bigger. They will be casting spells, Ishai will be getting plus one plus one counters, and you always have the option, without spending a card from your hand, to cast Jeska, minus zero her, and have Ishai fly in for triple damage. It is very easy with an evasive commander like Ishai to rapidly end games, even easier when he is dealing triple damage. While this is not the primary win condition of this particular deck, it is much more of an Underworld Breach deck, it is an extremely powerful and easy to access secondary win condition that can end games quickly and remove players who are too close to winning. So let's start to move outside of CEDH. What does this mean to us at other tables? The combat phase is still a time to shine. Aggro is not dead. We should look at cards like Paco and recognize that commanders who incidentally have a high power, evasiveness, or both, can be a massive force to pressure life totals in a game of Commander, particularly when they already provide a value engine of their own. I am very fond of my old Greven Predator Captain deck, where Greven could easily draw buckets of cards and hit like a truck, particularly when built to take advantage of losing tons of life. And Menace. Menace is always better at making your Commander evasive than other players will assume that it is. Outside of CDH, Krom, Ludovic's Opus, often sees play as a powerful beat stick in the air. A 4-4 flying haste body can do a lot of damage very quickly. Kenrith, the Returned King, is a fairly large body as well that you can pump with plus one plus one counters, using those extra pieces of mana you have left over at the end of your opponent's turn, who can give himself trample. In CDH, Krom and Kenrith are both in a similar category, where they can be a surprisingly effective clock when the game is locked down, but these are rarely your plan A or your plan B. Jeska Ishai, for example, uses Ishai as a very strong plan B if the Underworld Breach package is not coming together, or if someone needs to be knocked out of the game in a hurry. If your metagame is slow enough, you can absolutely plan to win off the back of someone like Kenrith or Krom, but you really need to analyze your metagame to know what you're getting yourself into. Commanders who support a go-wide strategy like Najila does can overwhelm decks trying to be more efficient on the stack and are neglecting their ground game. Alex's Reese the Redeemed Bruise that he has brought over time and time again can grow a board of tokens with frightening speed and quickly threaten to end games in a way that Cranko, Mob Boss, has been shown able to do over and over and over again ever since his printing all those years ago, and it doesn't take much for goblins to get out of hand. If your goal is to win through combat, you need to make sure that your attackers can get around or over your opponent's defenses. You're going to get nowhere fast if you plan to beat in with a 3-3 and your opponents are all playing bigger creatures than you. Know your metagame. Know which kind of creatures you expect to see on the other side of the battlefield, particularly if they're coming from the command zone. If you are routinely playing against Omnath Locus of Rage, you probably want to make sure that if you're going to win through combat, you can do so before that opponent can get Omnath online reliably, or have a way to fly over those elementals. The other thing to keep in mind is that if your commander isn't already providing you with value, synergy, or access to a compelling primary game plan from its color identity, just playing a creature with an impressive stat line often is not enough to cut it anymore. A single piece of interaction can take you off of your win condition, and there is no better way to force an opponent to use that interaction than to attack your opponent with a creature whose stat line reads, Big, Big. You really want your commander to be providing you some unique synergy that advances your game plan in addition to being big, or provides you a steady stream of value in order to go over what your opponents are trying to do. Keep these lessons from CEDH in mind when you are brewing your next commander deck, Particularly if your plan is to win it through combat, driving your opponents from 40 to 0 in the beautiful combat step. Until next time, I'm John, this is Gemstone Mine. You can reach the crew from Gemstone Mine on Twitter at GemstoneMineMTG, or send us an email at GemstoneMinePodcast at gmail.com. On YouTube, we're Gemstone Mine Podcast. 
Be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell.